Welcome back to Face the Nation. We turn now to our political panel. John Heilman is managing editor of Bloomberg Politics and co-author of the book, Double Down, about the 2012 presidential campaign. Michael Crowley is the senior foreign affairs correspondent for Politico and CBS News political director John Dickerson is with us as well. Welcome to all of you. So we had a pretty interesting week this past week in terms of President Obama um, firing his defense secretary, uh, Chuck Hagel, as he submitted his resignation. Um, John, let's let's start with that issue. Do you think we'll see the president name a new choice to be defense secretary shortly? So I talked to somebody who's involved in this process right now. They said it could happen within the next several days. Some of the names we've heard are Jay Johnson, who's the head of the Home Department of Homeland Security, Ashton Carter, who is the deputy secretary of defense. Uh, what's interesting about this, so the criteria will be somebody who has power within the building, can, can work within the Pentagon, but also is trusted by the president. And the entire position of Secretary of Defense, this will be the fourth this president has had, is such a fascinating one to look at the extent to which the president wants to get his hands involved on a detailed level, but then also no president can be in charge and in control of everything. At his first meeting at the Pentagon, the president said to then Secretary of State Bob Gates, he said, I think of myself as parallel parking. In other words, I'm coming in, there are two wars going on, there are a host of holdover uh, policies from the previous administration. I just want to fit myself in between what's going on. But now you've had three secretaries of defense all leave saying they felt micromanaged. They felt like the White House was controlling everything. So the new person who comes in has to figure out whether they're going to have autonomy or whether they're going to be seen just as a puppet of the president. Michael, I mean, is this sort of belly aching by people who don't like you know, the process that goes on, or is, there, is, it, is the process really dysfunctional? Well, it, it, I think it's some of both. Um, at what you've seen is a gradual centralization of foreign policy, not just national security, military strategy, but foreign policy writ large in this White House, to a degree that a lot of people say is unprecedented, where a few people in the White House, the National Security Council, right now specifically National Security Advisor Susan Rice and White House Chief of Staff Dennis McDonough, who has a foreign policy background, uh, really have their hands on the controls here in a way that drives people in the outer orbit a little bit crazy. But this has been true since the beginning of this presidency. I mean, people had the same gripes about, for instance, Rice's predecessor, Tom Donilon. <clears throat> I think it's exacerbated, as one of my sources told me in my reporting, whenever the Pentagon is involved in military action, they, they want total autonomy, and any White House role drives them a little bit crazy. And so the more airstrikes we're doing, the more of that kind of complaining uh, you're going to hear. John, the Associated Press had a wonderful story essentially about this alleged micromanagement by the White House of the Pentagon saying that when Bob Gates first went over to Afghanistan, went to a special operations command, that he saw that there was a phone line that went directly back to the White House, essentially bypassing the chain of command. And he ripped the phone line out and he said, if the White House wants to talk to anybody, they can go through me first. Is this you know, about personality, or is this really affecting policy, like a real policy on, on Syria, as some have charged? Well, I think, look, first of all, everything that Mike said I think is really true. This is uh, not just in foreign policy, but in general in this White House. This is an unusually uh, close team around the president. The president, we've observed this over the course of the last six years. In all areas, the president likes to have a small number of advisors. He likes to have people who he trusts close to him. Anyone who is outside that inner circle has a hard time getting things done. And that's been the case for all three of these secretaries of defense, all of whom were people of, of great, uh, uh, have great resumes and a great stature. But Bob Gates, Leon Panetta, and now Chuck Hagel all had a hard time making their way into that Obama inner circle and having his kind of trust. I think there, there's, there, there's also this macro picture. This is a really, uh, the, the, managing the Pentagon is maybe not the most monstrous challenge for anybody ever in the cabinet. And right now, when foreign policy and national security is going so strikingly awry, uh, I think that the greatest defense secretary ever would have had a hard time satisfying all the constituencies involved at the Pentagon, in the White House, and on the world stage. So if, if someone like Ashton Carter is named to be defense secretary, would he be someone who uh, works closely with the White House in terms of their micromanaging? Is he going to want more autonomy? I mean, what's sort of the calculus that's going on? They'll all want autonomy because they won't be able to work within the institution of the Pentagon unless they're seen as having autonomy. They and don't he's been to... a number two at the Pentagon. He's, right. he's and, grown up at the Pentagon. And he also is in charge of weapons procurement. He knows the budgets. And so budgets are a big part of this, both in terms of who gets what they want within the building, but also in terms of what the administration wants to do. It's the less sexy part of this, but it's an important part of it. I think one part about micromanaging 
micromanaging here is all presidents want to micromanage yeah. in part because they're the ones who get blamed in the end. Right. And so when something happens and it's, well, the president was asleep at the switch, they have to be able to say, well, if I'm going to get blamed for being asleep at the switch, I better be at the switch. The problem is you can't be at all switches because that diminishes the power of the person you've tried to yeah. empower to do things. Yeah, Michael, what's wrong with that? What's wrong with having control with the president saying, I want it done this way and then policy being very yeah. clear? I mean, how is it affecting the policy against ISIS, the policy in Syria? That's what you hear back. I had a long conversation with a senior, very smart uh, Pentagon official a couple days ago who essentially said, you guys in the press are obsessed with this micromanaging. There's a lot of meetings. It's pretty annoying. It chews up huge amounts of staff time, drives us a little crazy. But at the end of the day, show me the connection from A to B that it's screwing up our policy. Uh, now, that said, the policy needs more clarity right now. I mean, I think there's a consensus, even within that inner circle of the presidents, that we're not exactly sure how our strategy to defeat ISIS intersects with the Syrian civil war writ large, Bashar al-Assad. Um, are we gonna defend these rebel forces that we're training up to, to take on the Syrian regime if Assad starts dropping barrel bombs on them? Is If we have a new authorization for military force, will it authorize strikes against Syrian forces if they're going after our rebel allies? That's all not figured out yet. But it's not clear that that's because they're having too many meetings and Dennis McDonough wants to call 100 meetings on every single question. Uh, but, but, but that would be the problem. Uh, but no one has really made that connection yet, I think. One of the things, though, that's really frustrating, I know to people in the White House, in particular the Chief of Staff, is that over the last year in particular, there have been a series of leaks out of the Pentagon, where stories have appeared in the New York Times and other places, and this is a time-honored business, right? The Pentagon, people in the Pentagon know how to play the press, and one of the ways in which they do that is by making sure stories get planted in the press that limit the president's ability to maneuver on these issues, right? I can remember this on the troop drawdown in Afghanistan, how many forces to leave in Afghanistan. And you've seen this on the ISIS thing, you've seen this in Syria, where stories have come out at pivotal moments in the debate that have clearly come from within the military that have been meaning to set the framework for what is within the realm of the possible, and one of the things that I think they've felt very strongly in the White House was that Chuck Hagel did not do a great job from their, from their point of view at containing that. The fact that he did not have the kind of institutional uh, knowledge at the Pentagon was a huge hindrance for him. What I always you to think about Chuck Hagel, to, in order to tame the Pentagon, which is part of what the Defense Secretary has to do on behalf of the administration, you need to know the building. And he didn't really know the building, and Ash Carter may know it better and have a better chance of doing it. Definitely knows it better and was effectively running the place when he was under Hagel. And another important thing that you brought up in the panel with the senators is this person's going to have to get confirmed. And Ashton Carter, when he left the Pentagon, John McCain, the, the incoming probably chairman of the Armed Services Committee, said glowing things about him. That that's helpful for an administration that's going to be trying to yeah. get somebody through.